I am Dr. Anton Bilchuk, Nadia's older brother. And I'm the younger sister, Nadia Bilchuk. We are inundated with misinformation as it relates to healthcare. And what we are trying to do with this podcast is to have a discussion based on facts, based on peer review publications, based on credible sources. So join us so that you can live long, live strong, and live healthily. And a very good Saturday morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are and wherever you are listening to this. And if it's recorded, whatever time of the day or night it is. I'm Nadia Bilchik, and every week I've been talking to my brother, cancer surgeon and researcher, Dr. Anton Bilchik. We started this podcast when Princess Kate was diagnosed with cancer and told us she was having preventative chemotherapy. Our first podcast was around understanding and unpacking that. Last week, we spoke about early diagnosis. And this week, I am really looking forward to our conversation around inflammation. Dr. Anton Vilchik, my brother. Anton, I wanted to tell you before we start that as a result of our podcast so far, I have had numerous people telling me they are going for long overdue colonoscopies and mammograms. I also wanted to tell you that I've had several people saying they are starting to exercise. So I'm just thrilled that we are having an impact because that is the goal of live strong, live long, live healthy with Dr. Anton Vilchik and his sister, younger sister, Nadia Belchik. And on today, we are talking inflammation. I have to say that it, it, it's wonderful to think in terms of New Year's resolutions in April. So I'm really ecstatic to hear that we're making some impact. Uh, inflammation is one of the most interesting areas right now in terms of what causes heart disease and what what causes cancer? It's abs- this is this is absolutely the most fascinating topic because it covers lifestyle, it covers diet, it covers so many things that that our viewers can can do to reduce the chance of getting heart disease and reduce the chance of getting cancer. And what's also fascinating about this topic is that the observation was really made in about 1863 by Verco when. Uh, he noticed that within cancer cells, there were inflammatory cells. Fast forward to the last decade, that's when all this exciting research has been done. So this is a relatively new field, but it provides some understanding as to what may cause heart disease and what may cause cancer. So let's start off discussing one of the major contributing factors. And Anton and I have discussed this prior to coming on because I knew so little about this. And you mentioned stress. Let's talk about stress, lifestyle, as a contributing factor to inflammation. So we've known for a while that stress can do bad things to our body. When we're under stress, we get stomach pains, Some people get bloating, some people get diarrhea, some people get palpitations, uh, and that's led to a lot of apps, leading meditation apps, stress reduction apps. What we have right now is now we we have actual science that shows that if you're under stress, your corticosteroids, your um, epinephrine levels can go up, and these can have a significant effect on your immune system. We talk in terms of our immune system. We're thinking about these immune cells, T cells. We're thinking in terms of what are uh, what are called cytokines or interleukins. It's just a fancy, fancy term for what controls our immune system. And what studies are showing uh, is that when you're under stress, these uh, immune cells are negatively impacted. And if these immune cells are negatively impacted, then the balance within our body changes, which can then put you at risk for heart disease and potentially cancer. So again, 
that is so helpful to understand that stress can contribute to inflammation. And I know you yourself are an avid exerciser. Let's talk to people today who are going, I am stressed. What are the first steps people can take? And I'm delighted to see that we are, just take a moment before you answer the question. We are streaming live across X, Twitter, previously known as Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. If you've just joined us, I am talking to my brother, cancer surgeon and researcher, Dr. Anton Bilchik. Our podcast started talking about Princess Kate and cancer. We are now talking about inflammation, which is such an important topic. And if you are watching us recorded, then what can you do to reduce stress, reduce inflammation? So if we live our lives thinking in terms of what causes inflammation and what is anti-inflammation, that's going to go a long way in terms of reducing the chance of getting uh, heart disease or, or cancer. So let's talk about um, exercise. So exercise is anti-inflammatory. So again, um, several research studies have shown that when you exercise, it has a positive effect on the, on the immune system. And it's recommended that everyone should exercise uh, a minimum of 150 minutes a week. So that's 30 minutes a day, five days a week. And to, to do it continuously. Now, what, what has recently um, been shown in the literature, which I think is, is, is fascinating, you know, we often think of exercise as just being aerobic, walking, running, being the most healthy. But now there are studies to show that resistance training is, is anti-inflammatory. And that resistance training may actually be have a more significant anti-inflammatory effect than aerobic exercise. So it's still recommended that you do both. But the fact that these studies are showing that the combination of resistance training and aerobic exercise reduce inflammation and reduce the chance of getting heart disease and cancer is, is, is quite um, enlightening. What is even more interesting with these studies is that resistance training appears to be more important in women than in men. Women than men. So can we talk about resistance training being some form of weight training? Would water aerobics, where you're resisting against the water, would that, is that resistance training? I mean, can you break it down for us, and especially for those of us who are really resistant to exercising? Because I am hoping that today, if you're joining us and you are not doing resistance exercise, that you'll do it in some form or other. So the wonderful thing about the wonderful thing about resistance training is it's it's very broad. So resistance training could be weights. Resistance training could be um, core exercise. It doesn't have to be weights. It's quite simply any um, you know using using your muscles in some way with some form of resistance. So you could take an elastic band, you know, one of those stretchy Correct. elastic bands, Correct. and you could do something that's that's forming some kind of resistance to build muscle is what you're Yeah, saying. I mean, just, just think about it. If you're sitting watching TV and the last thing you feel like doing is going for a run or going for a walk, just taking an elastic band and doing some form of resistance training or resistance exercise is beneficial. And to think of that as having a profound effect on your immune system Um and that there's now data and science behind that. Um, I, I think everyone should have on their couch or on their bed something that they can do to, a, as a form of uh, resistance training, you know, which is, as I said, very simple to do. If you even, I mean, it's amazing. And because you think about how much, I don't know about people who are joining us today, but how much Netflix or streaming you watch. I certainly <laughs> am definitely fall into the addict category. But if I just did push-ups on the back of my bed while I was watching for five minutes, that would constitute resistance training. That's resistance training. Doing a plank is resistance training. There, there, there is resistance training for everyone. You know, we... we we previously used to think of resistance training as lift, lifting heavy weights. You know, one has to differentiate between 
doing resistance training and exercise and too much exercise. So again, let's get back to this, what's anti-inflammatory and what's pro-inflammatory. If you do too much exercise and cause damage to your muscles, that's pro-inflammatory. So pro-inflammatory going to have a negative impact on the immune system. So no one should overdo it either. So we've touched on exercise and that's a huge, you know, we could do an entire podcast, of course, just on exercise, but we want to really give you as much information as possible in the time we have together. Let's talk about nutrition and food in terms of inflammation. Well, I think that this again is a fascinating topic. I didn't realize um, how significant food is or what a, what a major role food plays in inflammation. There's now uh, level one evidence that eating um, too much red meat, processed food is pro-inflammatory. And level one evidence for those... The lady- level one evidence means it, it's the most that the science is so strong behind it. You know, we, we talk about level one, two, three, four. Level four is kind of if, maybe, but don't know. Level one means it's, so, it's been looked at uh, scientifically so thoroughly that uh, no one should be having red meat every day. Processed food, try and avoid it. I mean, not only is it pro-inflammatory, but processed food likely contains toxins. So when we think of processed food, polonies, when we think about looking at a label, things that have a multitude of ingredients. And again, what we're saying, probably most people have heard of, you know, and in training, I talk about something called a BLO, a blinding light of the obvious. And just because it's a BLO doesn't mean that we do it. So if from today you go, I am really not going to eat processed food, meaning I am not going to go to a vending machine and buy a Twinkie. I don't know if Twinkies are available anymore, but the equivalent of a Twinkie or really limiting anything that doesn't have whole ingredients is so essential. So the the, the fascinating part of that is that vet, you, you've got the obvious, which are vending machines, but then you may not realize that foods that you think are healthy are processed. Like? Um, so if you have a nutritional bar that's, that's mm-hmm. you know, I think one has to think in terms of pretty much um, – Things that we put in the microwave um, could well be processed. It's, I think it's a very, very, it's a very broad, it's a very, very broad um, subject in terms of what constitutes processed food. And I think part of the problem is that we think we're eating healthy when those foods may be processed, or maybe have some chemicals, or may may be in a container that contains something to keep it. Um, healthy for longer or, or, to, or to delay it from, you know, going stale. I mean, I think that there's... Yes, it's a preservatives. Yes. Got it. Preservatives. And then you touched on this when we were having our pre-interview interview around the so-called Mediterranean diet in terms of being anti-inflammatory. And you found some fascinating things there. Yeah, I didn't realize that. I mean, I've always thought of the Mediterranean diet as being healthy and everyone seems to be talking about the Mediterranean diet. And I think our viewers know what the Mediterranean diet is, you know, olives, um, fiber, um, healthy poly, poly uh, unsaturated fats, um, low in, low in sugar. Uh, so I think everyone knows what the Mediterranean diet is. What, what, um, what is fascinating is that they've actually compared um, people taking a Mediterranean diet to a European diet or an American diet and shown that the Mediterranean diet is anti-inflammatory and actually there's a lower incidence of heart disease and cancer in people that eat a Mediterranean diet. What I also find fascinating about the Mediterranean diet is that it actually part of the definition of the Mediterranean diet is a couple glasses of red wine. <laughs> Not every day though, right? Well, they say red wine with meals. That's the classic definition of a Mediterranean meal. I mean, the Mediterranean diet, I, 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 I certainly am not suggesting that one should have it every day or with every meal, but I just find it really interesting that that red wine, because it contains something called reservatrol, is, is healthy on the heart. And again, going with the Mediterranean diet, anti-inflammatory, but, but what is 
what is fascinating about all this is that there's research and science behind the importance of the Mediterranean diet. As it's not just about a a healthy diet that makes you feel better. It actually reduces disease. So again, it would be high in things like olive oil versus other oils, high in grains, high in vegetables, high in fruits, protein, but lean protein. Correct. And I love the idea of wine, although you have mentioned, and I listen carefully to everything you say, that alcohol is inflammatory, but a little bit of red wine can prove to be the opposite with food. Yes, and I'm glad you brought that up because the last thing we want to do is to turn um, our viewers into alcoholics. And, <laughs> and, and so you're absolutely right. Alcohol is inflammatory alcohol in excess is very inflammatory so many whether it's heart disease or cancer just about everything is linked to um, excessive alcohol intake and again this gets back to how alcohol not not only can it have a negative impact on the liver but it can also have a negative impact on the immune cells ca causing um, inflammation and leading to cancer and heart disease. So I have no doubt that one of the treatments that Princess Kate would be getting right now, obviously they're looking at, we spoke about the chemotherapy um, previously, but very careful nutrition. I'm assuming that her physicians, her team of physicians are looking very carefully at what she is eating in order to boost the immune system. I think there are because not only is nutrition important, in pre you know, preventing disease. But if you are diagnosed with cancer, then good nutrition actually improves your response to treatment, as does exercise. So anyone with cancer that's getting treatment, the last thing you want them to do is to stay in bed, not go out, be inactive. Both exercise and nutrition improves your response to chemotherapy. So there's absolutely no doubt that um, that with uh, Princess Kate, nutrition is an essential part of her recovery, as is exercise, as is stress reduction. Which is why we haven't been seeing her appearing and obviously... She's really looking at her life and her lifestyle in order to get strong. But it's so interesting, Anton, because it still is fascinating people. I go to dinner parties or conversations and people are so intrigued. What does she really have? Um, is it abdominal? Is it ovarian? And until we know fully, it's not something. So I want to just say that's something we will continue to discuss as we hear news updates. But today, let's focus on the concept of inflammation and then look at, we're looking at a couple of other factors, environmental factors in terms of inflammation. When you spoke about environmental factors, help unpack that for us. So many people will, will ask, um, how, you know, how did I get cancer? I'm healthy or I exercise, I'm, you know, I'm not overweight. Um, what else is there that could have caused cancer? And, you know, the environment, when we talk about the environment, we're talking about, um, you know, cigarette smoking, exposure to cigarette smoking, um, exposure to radioactive materials. I mean, there's evidence that, you know, that the cell phone, uh, some studies have shown that excessive Exposure to cell phone has led to a higher chance of getting brain cancer. I mean, those, you know, those, the, the, those studies are, are certainly out there. Uh, I'm not saying that the cell phone causes brain cancer. I'm just saying that when we talk about the environment, we have to think of everything around us. Uh, living close to power lines, uh, living close to, to power plants, living close to there's there certain areas within the country where there's a lot of farming going on and there are environmental pollutants. Um, so the environment is, is something that people have to be very aware of because, again, uh, very strong evidence that uh, being exposed to certain factors 
uh, can directly lead to cancer and heart disease. So we are going to talk about viruses and bacteria, bacteria and viruses. So that also is a part of uh, inflammation. And I have to tell you that when, when I first heard that a bacteria could cause stomach cancer, or a bacteria could cause a, a cancer called lymphoma within the stomach. I thought there is no way, you know, bacteria causes a sore throat, bacteria causes a sore ear, bacteria causes an infection in the eye, but a bacteria causing cancer. But there is now very, very strong evidence that a bacteria called H. pylori or Helicobacter pylori, which is in our stomach, is associated with lymphoma of the stomach and is associated with gastric cancer. And there is there are ways of testing for H. pylori and there are ways of treating H. pylori. So that's just one example. But then we get to the obvious um, uh, bacteria and viruses that, that are well known. So hepatitis B and hepatitis C both can lead to damage to the liver, can lead to cirrhosis, which is more damage to the liver, and then liver cancer. How do we get hepatitis uh, C? Uh, it's caused by, um, uh, it, it's, it's either sexually transmitted or it can be caused by intravenous drug use. Um, in, in my world, uh, if a doctor sticks himself or, an, or a healthcare professional sticks himself with a needle, um, one of the first tests that they're going to have done to test both the patient and the health professional is for hepatitis and 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 HIV. But but hepatitis is a well known cause for um, for for liver cancer. What what is also interesting, just to shift gears about liver cancer, is that hepatitis used to be um, the most common cause of liver cancer, but now Interestingly, the most common cause for liver cancer is fatty liver disease. It's called um, NASH or non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, NASH or NAFLD, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And, and how do you know if you have that? What size? So, so, yeah, so so this you, you know this gets to a uh, another very interesting topic because it is so common. And I have to tell you the number of people because I do. Um, a lot of abdominal surgery, the number of young people that have normal liver function, that um, are healthy, and there's nothing on their, on their scans or x-rays that show that they have liver disease, just taking one look at the liver with a camera, um, and you see these fat deposits, that is consistent with fatty liver disease. So there is no great way to detect early fatty liver disease. Unfortunately, most times when fatty liver disease uh, presents, um, it's when people are um, having liver dysfunction or you know for other reasons. So I think what, what is most important about fatty liver disease is getting back to the whole topic of this discussion today, which is um, lifestyle, diet, all the things you can do to prevent fatty liver disease, exercise. Um, there's... The, the, you know, there's there's obviously um, another whole area of that you know of um, statins. Um, now, when we think in terms of of statins, of which so remember many that are, many of our viewers are on including me. cholesterol lowering medication. <laughs> right, it, 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 cholesterol lowering medications. You know, we think that cholesterol that the that the major effect of cholesterol lowering medications is to lower cholesterol. But guess what? These medicines are anti-inflammatory. And and so, you know, this gets back to the the you know the whole concept of of the importance of of inflammation and how statins work. Uh, but certainly it's 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 imperative that people pay very careful attention to their cholesterol levels to their triglyceride levels because the chances are if they're elevated they have um, fatty liver disease and fatty liver disease is is preventable and has become 
the, the single most common cause of liver cancer in this yeah in this country now, which is which is a change over the last decade. That is a lot of information. Our 25 minutes are nearly up. We're trying to keep our podcast for you down to 25 minutes. We will go a little longer because some questions are coming in. One of the questions is, Princess Kate seemed seemingly healthy. Which of these factors, and again, we are talking about supposition here because we don't know contributed to her being ill because she appeared so young and healthy and trim and slim and exercise. So that's one question that's coming in. And another question that's coming in is what about cortisone shots to reduce inflammation? So anything you want to answer around those, we can also hold it till our next episode. So to answer your second question first, um, we've got to think in terms of, and I'm glad you asked the question because we've got to think in terms of acute inflammation. So acute inflammation, um, just hurting yourself, bruising yourself, um, you know, th that's not a cause of heart disease or a cause of cancer. You know, what we're really focusing on today is chronic inflammation. Now, when you talk, uh, when you talk about steroids, uh, which is uh, prednisone, that's, um, that's used for inflammation, people that have um, uh, back pain or have some sciatica, sciatica will go on to steroids um, because that is anti-inflammatory. Anti but it's usually for a short period of time. There are some diseases where people are required to be on it for longer, and then it can have a negative impact on the immune system. So so that's the you know that's the second part of the of your question. The first part, and this gets back to to Princess Kate. So many of these factors we've spoken about today um, are potential explanations. Um, obviously, we just don't know, and most times we don't know the cause the cause of cancer. But the the one topic we have not touched on today are these two trillion bacteria within our body, the so called microbiome. Because the bacteria within our body communicate with the immune cells. And if there's dysfunction within the immune cells, there's probably dysfunction with the bacteria. And then and there are good bacteria and there are bad bacteria. And the good bacteria are helpful, the bad bacteria are not. And so somehow the disruption of the two may well have been, I'm not saying the cause in Princess Kate, but certainly that is a known factor as a potential cause for cancer and heart disease. Anton, my brother, Dr. Anton Bilchik, once again, I mean, just remarkable information. And we will continue over the next few weeks to unpack different things, different topics. I do want to say that this is information. Please, if you have any of these issues, go to your healthcare professional. Remember, we are doing this really to unpack some of the myths to help motivate you to exercise more, to eat better, to do what is in your control, because it sounds like there are so many factors that aren't, but the question is what is. So I think the concept of biome and on to discuss more. I know in our next episode, we are going to talk about what you should be asking your doctor, what you need to know. So let's tease that for those of you who will be joining us next week. We want to talk about what? I think that's a... Uh you know, fascinating topic because that will enable um, me to tell you some of the frustrations my patients experience in terms of communication and what we so often hear about from, from patients, which is, I just didn't get it. I didn't understand. I don't remember. And so I think it provides us an opportunity to look at it from both the patient's perspective and the doctor's perspective, how to make that visit um, really valuable so that you walk out of your doctor's office feeling like I got all the information that I need that that I that I needed to get. And let's talk about how we as patients are empowered and coming from you, Dr. Anton Bilchik, cancer surgeon, researcher, my older brother, and at the end of everything to our dear mother who lives in Johannesburg, South Africa. Hi, mom. <laughs> Hi, mom. Hi, mom. 
And thank you so much. Look forward to discussing the empowered patient, how to empower yourself as a patient next week. And I hope you have a week, all of you, of living strong, living long, and living healthy. Thank you, Antoine. Thank you.